With no further ado, I would like to introduce Rhoda Shantz, who is a professor in family and consumer sciences at UW, where she's been for 23 years. Rhoda has told me this morning that she is going to do the bulk of the introducing of herself. So the <laughs> self-introducing speaker is fantastic. But I do, I do want to tell you that um, Rhoda got her bachelor's and master's degree from North Dakota State, which I have to be... Yeah. Thank you. I have to read that very carefully, because last night at the reception, I said she was from the University of North Dakota, and, and that was really bad and my North Dakota vis visiting privileges have been, have been withdrawn. You, North Dakota State. And uh, she got her PhD from Kansas State. Her expertise is food science, food pro product development, and safety. And her talk today is called The Science Behind Heritage Food. So welcome, Rhoda Shantz. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate being here. I hope you can hear me because I don't have the room microphone on. Are you okay? Yeah, okay. Well, I had mentioned I'd like to introduce myself as far as what my background is. It's so different from the two other speakers and I haven't been involved with the humanities, Wyoming Humanities Council because I'm a scientist, a hard scientist. I started off in chemistry for three years and then my advisor asked me, what, do you, what are your hobbies? I can tell you're burned out on chemistry. I said, I love to cook and bake with my mom and grandma. <laughs> anyway, both now deceased. But what I did is I transferred to go into dietetics. So I am a registered dietitian. And then my master's and PhD were food science and food chemistry. And yes, I do teach courses where I teach food product development where the students learn how to make some of those packaged foods. And we do food profiling because I also teach sensory analysis. My approach in teaching is hands-on. I'm a hands-on learner. I have samples I'm going to pass around. You can touch them. You can get an idea of how they are behaving. Um, I always start at the beginning. My international graduate students have pointed out, Dr. Shantz, you always start at the beginning with yeah. the topic. I do teach in, um, an introductory food science course called the Scientific Study of Food. In that course, we cover every food category. We start off with fruit, a week of fruit, and a lab on fruit. Vegetables, a week of vegetables, lab on vegetables. And then we continue on to uh, our protein-based foods, eggs, milk, meat, poultry, fish, on to our cereals and grains, two weeks of that, where we cover rice and pasta. And then we finally get into baked products. And baked products, cakes, pies, pie crust, I should say, and then finally, we end with crystallization lab, which do any of you know what foods are in crystallization lab? Candy and ice cream. So I get to end on that high note of candy and ice cream, right? So that's my freshman class. And then the, so the junior class, we cover meal management, table setting, um, meal management, time management, all of that. Another junior class after that is quantity food. And yes, I can cook for 300 people with the right kitchen. And the students that are in my program, I'm the director of the dietetics program, so the students are becoming dietitians. So they have to understand all those principles, the food science, and then also the uh, meal management, table setting, quantity food. And my final undergraduate course is experimental foods, where we take a family recipe and make it healthier by either reducing the fat or it, this year the popular one is gluten-free baking. So trying to use rice flour and bean flour and um, gosh, coconut flour for some of our baked products. Okay, <laughs> I cover. I can cover nutrition aspects, but I've covered more that science be behind food today, okay? And I know John had mentioned I might be talking about nutrition, but not so much, okay? Okay, my slides, I uh, walk and talk, and I always have samples. So my slides are some pretty background 
of UW in case you want to look at the sites ex and not me. Listen to me. I am not a talking head. I don't like to be a talking head. But today, uh, looking at key ingredients last night uh, and the website when I was asked to present here, I decided I have to fit somewhere. You know, I'm not a social scientist. I'm a hard scientist. I have to figure out where I fit. So if you've gone to the library, and thank you again, um, Patty and Carol, for last <coughs> night. Uh, whoops. In the key ingredients, I would be at the section five, home cooking. I thought that was the closest thing I could come to for heritage cooking and talking about heritage cooking and all. I want to cover the prehistoric food, and that is uh, coming from a project which I think got me this publicity to be invited. And that was a project with the anthropology department, and we looked at the diet of the prehistoric uh, um, Shoshone at, in that area, the Big Horn, and we analyzed it. So the behind the scenes science analyzing for protein and carbohydrate and fiber and uh, fat, that was my end of it. And then we also calculated calories for the diet and looking at what a starvation diet could be. And then I'm going to cover heritage food and the science behind it. And with the science, I'm going to use words like protein and lipids and carbohydrates. In addition, some words such as gelatinization and coagulation. Those get my students really mixed up. But I do like to take you step by step onto this. And then finally, a little summary, uh, if we have time. I have a timer down here. OK, with the prehistoric food, any questions so far? Yes? No? OK. We can have an interactive session. With the prehistoric food, uh, that project was written up in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources magazine called Reflections, or referred to as Reflections. And many of you might already be on a mailing list to get this article. This is where we published what uh, the hunters and gatherers were eating, and John had already brought that into play, that they were not into agriculture. They were not growing crops. They were moving along. The men, usually the bighorn sheep were hunted, and the women were gathering, right? In the springtime, the, uh, you know, the meat had to sustain over the winter months. In the springtime, we have crops still, not crops, but plants still in that area of Wyoming where we were able to sample what we are assuming they ate. Pine nuts. You know pine nuts from pine trees? So gathering those, oh, they, to peel, they really get your hands dirty and they really take a lot of effort because their shell is so close to the skin. But they're high protein. Then we have uh, spring beauties, and the sp spring beauties are high in vitamin C, and that an antioxidant. So after the winter months, now trying to cleanse the body of some toxins uh, that build up. Also, the biscuit root is still available, and the yampa, and yampa is high in fiber and also in inulin. And if you're up on what's going on with the next stages in our nutrition, it's using prebiotics and probiotics. So inulin is a prebiotic. You've heard probiotics through yogurt, right, and some of those fermented products. We're in a wondrous time having so much uh, scientific technology that we are finding th items like uh, sauerkraut now being a, a prebiotic, 
And we just thought it was a condiment or a sandwich fixing for those Rubens. So it, it's, just, it's just been a real wonderful uh, time. And then lastly, with the grains, uh, the hunters and gatherers did not have agriculture. They did not practice agriculture. So we're assuming they didn't have grain products in their diet, but they actually did. They still did take seeds of grasses and try grinding them up. There's so much evidence of uh, residue on some of those ancient uh, cooking utensils and the cereals and grains were still, were part of their diet even though they were hunters and gatherers. So that's the basic of where I wanted to start with, let's go back, now move forward a little bit to some of our background and some of our heritage. The question last night was about, to me by someone, oh, uh, Pat, Patty, yeah. Uh, what's the difference between heirloom foods and heritage foods? Well, the heirlooms are plants that have been bred. You know, we have agronomy uh, specialists, and they're able to make a plant so that it's hardy. It can ship from California to Wyoming. Those are those wonderful red tomatoes, <laughs> tasteless. At the turn of the 1900, we had tomatoes that were tart, very acidic, um, and soft, and now we're finding many heirloom tomatoes being grown and marketed at our local markets. We, we made that tomato hearty and without as much acid, so people would eat more tomatoes. We may also have changed some of the nutritional content of those tomatoes as we bred them to our modern day. Now, when we preserve food, we are preserved tomatoes, we also have to add acid. We have to add some citric acid to acidify the contents, whereas the heirloom tomatoes you do not. I also teach food preservation, so that could be something uh, uh, you may have some questions about as well. Okay, with heritage foods, they are foods from our background, our culture, our um, family, you know. I am uh, for, uh, second generation German-Russian descent. Both grandparents on both sides uh, came over from the Ukraine area. So I'm also a farm kid from North Dakota, southwestern North Dakota, so that agricultural background is in me. But I learned how to cook and bake from my mom. They told me how to do things, but never explained why, okay? So I want to get into that for our science part of the food um, presentation today. For heritage food, a lot of it has to do with what John had already said. Different families have different recipes, and they might spice it a little differently, but basically the dish is the dish, okay? And that's what we all find in our heritage, those recipes that are handed down from generation to generation. You taste strudel from another family in my small community where I was born and raised, and there, theirs is a little bit different than what I have grown up with, especially with some of those techniques of apple strudel, sliced apples versus grated apples. Just little differences like that. Also, with the strudel I grew up with, we had apple strudel which had cottage cheese in. And my aunt, who made it from the Shantz side rather than my family, my mom's family, the Forster side, she s put the cottage th cheese through a sieve or a ricer, so it was really fine. We use large curd cottage cheese. So, you know, those subtle differences. But that's our heritage. So their family is handing down their recipes to subsequent generations. It is sad now that the generations aren't into cooking like they used to be. And now I think the resurgence of home cooking is coming about because of nutrition. 
and where people have to be on a gluten-free diet or a low-fat diet, cooking at home is the way to control those ingredients, eliminate them or reduce them. Also with heritage food, it's where it was made. And you've heard of Taste of Place. It is a book, but it's also a, a concept that where a food is grown or where a plant is grown or where the cow is raised and grown and what they eat does affect their taste, right? That's how the whole French nation is. They pride themselves in what's called terroir. It's a hard word for me to say. I probably have butchered the word. But it's their wine tastes a certain way because of where it's grown. Well, now we're starting to learn that in California with the wines. Highlight the Washington State wines, the Oregon wines, the California wines. They're all West Coast wines, but they all taste differently because of the growing conditions. You know, the amount of sunshine, the soil, the minerals in the soil. You know, it's our heritage food came from a certain place. You know, like I say, in the old country, in that German-Russian background that I have. So keeping in mind, we've been fed these family recipes handed down from generation. We've made them. We make them because that's how my mom and grandma told me. But now, as a scientist, I learned how or why. We're doing it that way. Oh, Rhoda, don't, don't uh, over roll the pie crust. OK, why? OK, <laughs> never told me why. Then they started thinking I was getting too smart for my own good, <laughs> right? <laughs> OK, the science of food, the part that I love. I love it all. I love food, can't you tell? Of course, then my hobbies are cooking and baking. I mean, I think about food all the time. OK, the first thing we have for the science of food, oh, I'll have to go check. Was it protein? With, yeah. I, I like to pick on protein first. Protein is our most valuable nutrient. It has to be protected. And that's why we have fat and uh, starch to protect protein, obviously. But when we look at protein foods, we're always thinking about meat, poultry, fish, number one. And then they're byproducts, right? Milk, cheese, eggs. But we also have our um, cereals and grains. They also have protein. And then how about our legumes? Dried peas and lentils. So they're very important for individuals that are on a vegetarian diet, for whatever their reason is. But for gluten, what I have here, and I pass samples around in bags, in class also, sometimes on plates. But you can open the bag. You can touch these things. It's no problem. No one's going to be eating them after you touch them. But this first tray Peter's going to pass around, I have gluten balls. This is a class activity to prove how much protein there really is in wheat flour. And with this protein in wheat flour, how it can hold steam and how it can hold carbon dioxide when the yeast is fermenting and giving rise to that dough. So the first sample is all-purpose flour. And it's middle of the road as far as protein content, 11%. 10%. All-purpose flour differs depending on what part of the country you are in the United States. Um, but then we have cake flour. Cake flour has a very little protein content. And any protein that is in cake flour, it's because it's come from soft wheat versus hard wheat. I should put a plug in. Hard red spring wheat family farm, that's what I know. Now I've gotten used to working with uh, the soft white wheat in the Torrington area of Wyoming for tortillas and all. But anyway, I can get off the topic, and my students know the minute I start talking, I can talk for three hours. So that's why I do an outline, so I keep on the task. 
But the last one is the bread flour sample. The largest amount of gluten in that sample. It is a flour from hard wheat, not durum wheat yet, but hard wheat. And it is able to form a lot of gluten. I pick on gluten again because of the premise that so many people are on gluten-free diets. And as a dietitian, I have to say it is the truth. Not everybody on a gluten-free diet has to be on a gluten-free diet. They think they do. They think it's a weight loss diet, and it's not. But those people that have to be on gluten-free diets, they have to take wheat out of their diet. So if they're making homemade bread, if they're making cake from scratch, cookies, what do they use to still give a structure that's rigid like this? See how rigid it is? It's not soft and delicate. Even the bread, even the cake flour gluten is not soft and delicate. It's still rigid. So that's what the whole task is for dietitians and for product developers that now have a lot of gluten-free products on the grocery store shelves, right? Gluten-free pasta, that's another story altogether, right? It's softer than our regular pasta. Okay, so I've made the point that protein is valuable. When we eat food, it's the protein part of the food is so valuable to our body as well. To build and maintain tissue, first and foremost. The other components, like the uh, lipids, they're there to protect the protein. The next sample is a set of pastry samples. And here's my demonstration of how lipids protect protein. So you have the gluten first, now we're looking at lipids protecting the gluten. And the idea of protecting the protein, gluten in this case, is that it makes a very tender product. Here again, these samples are in bags. They're a little greasy because of the lipids that I'm using. All lipids are greasy and the amounts of lipids. But you certainly can touch them through the bags and break them. I have plenty of little squares that you can break them off. Notice which one's more tender, which are tough. The first is what we refer to as the control. We always have a standard we're comparing the test treatments to. So the first pastry, uh, lipid, excuse me, is shortening. And shortening is now the ideal for um, pastry. You know, pie crust, that's especially what I'm talking about. Although I grew up with lard, so in my mind, lard is the best. And I'll tell you a little bit why after I go through the next sample. The, the, ne the second sample is butter, a natural lipid, not a man-made lipid like uh, shortening. And with butter, it has water. It's got 20% water and 80% lipid. So it's not 100% lipid. So it's not as effective as protecting protein as shortening would be because it is 100%. So how we get around that, and if any of you do make butter pastry or pie crust, you probably have figured this out already. Just add more butter, <laughs> right? So I added 150% butter to that recipe, and now it's nice and tender, right? The next sample is oil. Oil, supposed to be our health choice for lipid, but you know making pastry with it doesn't work. Oil is slick. You know, it's a lubricant in your car, right? It's to keep things lubricated. So it coats and coats and coats all that gluten. So now water can't get into it, right? So it's very, very tender. Sometimes we make that treatment and it, you try to take it from the tray and it falls apart. So the secret on that is use less oil, right? More butter, less oil. So now it makes it a pastry that's somewhat acceptable to most consumers and because from a nutrition point, we 
assume it's healthier because it's oil and not butter. You know, the um, cycle is coming about. Butter's healthier than shortening. That's the truth. It's natural. Our body knows what to do with butter, doesn't know what to do with shortening. But that, again, is a whole hour topic for another time with those trans fatty acids. Okay. I don't give it away what I think about it, I know. Okay. With the uh, other points that I want to make on these lipids is that when you've made some of your recipes that are handed down from generation to generation, you add the butter or the cream to the flour and you mix it up first with a fork or with your hands. I don't know what you're all making. For me, it's that pie crust. It's also strudel type things. Um, many of my Hispanic friends don't know how to cook. They're younger than I. They never learned it from their mom. And they make, um, what is it? I'm now forgetting. Where they have to manipulate a lipid into their flour. And they never knew why they had to do that. Okay. And then another one, I have college friends that are uh, from Norwegian background, and they make lefse. And so explaining to them when I have visited them that that same, you put the cream into the potatoes and you mix it around, that cream is heavy in fat. It's got about 40% fat, and that is protecting the starch, again, from the water. Sure. You know, I'm familiar with Crisco or something. Mm -hmm. what, what is it? Where does it come from? Shortening is soybean oil. And then, if we'd have a, a board, but Peter said I could write on the wall, not. Uh, <laughs> um, OK. OK. Um, I'll try to make it big. And I told Allie, I do talk a lot with my hands. So now, from a chemistry point of view, we have carbon, 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 carbon. So the big capital C all together. And with single bonds, so I'll go like that, between each of them. Carbon can have four single bonds. So the other bonds that aren't connected to carbon are hydrogen. When we make soybean oil into shortening, we add hydrogen into that oil, plus nitrogen, and we mix it around, oxygen also. And now all of a sudden, the, the hydrogen that's pumped in says, oh, I'm going to break some of those bonds that are originally on the carbon. And then they're floating around as they're mixed up. And then they reattach. And the carbon bonds in oil, there are many double bonds from carbon to carbon. So those double bonds are unstable during all this. And they break. That hydrogen connects on and in a different way, which is unnatural. And I go like this and like that, because that's what trans fatty acids are. They're like this and like this. The original were like this, right? straight. So our bodies, that's why we're now finding with research that um, trans fatty acids may be causing more heart disease and also cancer because our bodies are taking a molecule now that's unfamiliar and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. So our cells are starting to be confused and they don't um, divide, they don't do uh, their normal, natural way. I forgot, this is another point, the last sample in the lipid one is margarine. Margarine's that same way. It's taking corn oil and manipulating it into an unnatural state, or canola oil, or even olive oil margarine. And the, the doctors, our MDs, usually say use the softest margarine possible because Softer margarines have more natural oil in, not the trans fatty acids that form it in solid. And 
Margarine was created to be a pretend butter. There really is no reason to have margarine I, in, you know, in a health situation, not at all. So, did that help? Yeah. Okay. So, if you use lard uh -huh. instead of Crisco, yeah. lard has uh, the original bonds like that then? Yep. Yep. Good point. It brought me back to what I was going to say about lard. So lard, oh, we planted that one. So lard has the properties of oil and shortening is what it does. So, and lard is natural. So when you make pastry with it, you're going to get a soft, uh, I'm sorry, a tender pastry, not necessarily soft, but very tender so it breaks apart like the one with oil. And um, yet it has flakiness where pastry needs to be flaky. I know I have some bakers in here. <laughs> They're shaking their head. And so a solid lipid gives flakiness. Oil does not give flakiness, it gives tenderness. Yeah. I cannot get students to make the lard treatment for me when we do this in lab. I'm usually making it. And they say, oh, it smells like bacon, it tastes like bacon. Well, not to me. You know, it's like your water, chlorinated water. I don't taste the chlorine in the water. We're, you know, you're so used to it, but yet when you use it for laundry, you can really smell that chlorine, but not when you drink water. So it's what you're, what you're used to. Brother, yes. Can you say a little more about hydrogenation, oxygenation, rancidity, and these things about like margarine or hydrogen, cool. peanut butter? Yeah. Okay. So. I, I don't know where we're out of time, but this is fun. This is good. Um, so the CCCC, the natural um, bonding is taking place. So that's in like what David said, peanut butter, because it's high in fat, all nuts, almonds, almond butter, all of that. Um, even soybean <coughs> butter and all of that. Now, what happens when we have these long chains uh, they can become unstable. So oils have long chains. Butter has short chains. Butter has short chains. That's why it smells so good. The short chains are more are aromatic. Your oil isn't as uh, uh, aromatic. The olive oil is if you use extra virgin olive oil. You can really detect that. But they become unstable and they start breaking off. And they break off because of light, heat, you know, like if you use your oil to deep fry and then you save it and you use it again, okay. Uh, um, metal, you know, storing oil in metal cans versus glass or plastic bottles like they usually come in. They all can initiate what's called oxidation and starts breaking these things out and down and they're so random. And now we have oxygen coming in and saying, oh, I want to connect there. And that's the word ox oxidation or oxidative rancidity. Yeah. So to prevent your high lipid foods from becoming oxi oxidated, we want to uh, refrigerate them, not have them exposed to oxygen, light, heat, metal even for freezing baked products so they don't become rancid. You want to um, keep them covered, airtight, no oxygen coming. You have to use the right plastic bag. You can't use the bread sacks like my mom did and swore by them. It's just like, and I know now we're getting on a tangent, just like the ketchup bottle. The outside of the ketchup bottle is not touching food, so it doesn't have to be food grade plastic. The, in, the inside of the ketchup bottle is a food grade plastic, and it's layers thick, you know, what's in between, we're not going to touch food either, okay? So same thing with freezer bags versus bread bags. The bread bags are too thin the, to keep out oxygen. You know those meat wrappers in the grocery store, they're oxygen permeable. You pick them up, you can smell the meat. The oxygen goes in and out of that. Same thing with the bread wrapper. It's too thin. It can't keep that oxygen molecule out. 
Yeah. And double bagging works, triple bagging works, but gee, if you're doing that, you may as well, you know, put it in freezer grade uh, meat wrapper, uh, aluminum foil, or bags, or rigid containers, you know, Tupperware or Rubbermaid. Not that I'm promoting any brands, but those are very identifiable brands. Okay. Okay, the last part, are we, yeah, is starch. I hadn't talked about starch too much, but with those gluten balls, you see the bread flour is large gluten ball, the cake flour is a small gluten ball. They all started off with 100 grams of flour. Well, if you don't have protein in it, in that uh, flour, what's the remaining content? Starch. So with starch, it protects protein as well, as that lipid does. Okay? It will attract that water first. It's a solute, if you want to think of it as the same level of salt and sugar, being able to attract water because they're a solute. Starch will grab the water and not let protein have it. And if the protein in the flour can't have it, we can't form gluten or as much gluten. Okay, so now I'm getting into, wow, we're getting into baked products, aren't we? Flour, milk, eggs, all that liquid stuff, and sugar, you know? So all of that's coming into play. With starch, it's got that ability to get thick. And when it absorbs the water, gets thick, it also has structure. And we call it a, a starch matrix so that we're able to have water in be, trapped in between all this starch um, network, let's say. I've seen examples of those, you know, onion and onion bags and some of those netted bags, plastic bags, as far as they swell up. That's the idea that starch does, okay? With starch, our last set of samples, I have white rice, which is a very starchy food product, and then I've taken the rice and I've heated it, and now it is a dextrinized starch. And the dextrinized starch is what we form when we're making Spanish rice. If you make any Spanish rice, you've done this, taking white rice, and putting it in a cast iron frying pan, heating it up, mixing it around, all of a sudden it starts to smoke a little bit. Whoops, we burned it. It's easy to do. But that's what dextrinized starch is. So the second sample is a light tan color. I did it in the lab with students uh, doing their research and I didn't want to burn it. So it is pretty, pretty light, a nutty light color. And if you make gravy from scratch, right, homemade gravy, do the same thing. You take flour, you put it in a pan, you stir it around, get a little brown, and then you add the juice from the roast, and all it sizzles, and it gets thick, right? So it still has the ability to get thick when we dry heat it that way, but not as thick as if you wouldn't have heated it. So that's that theory, that science behind gravy making. You know, I say right away, I don't teach you how to make gravy, but I teach you that science behind making gravy. Okay, so now you have that going on, and that naturally occurs in baked products as well. The exterior part of baked products gets brown. You know, caramelization from the sugar, but also dextrinization of the, of the starch. The inside starch is thick. And so it's holding in carbon dioxide and air and starch as it's baking to give rise to that product, okay? But starch is there again to protect our lipid. Okay. Any other questions at, at this time? Okay, if not, my summary has to do with some of the new items I've mentioned about antioxidants, nutraceuticals, functional foods, all of that. What our grandparents taught us, or maybe some of you younger 
individuals, what your great-grandparents taught you, was to eat your vegetables, right? And make sure that you clean your plate. Well, that one we shouldn't really follow anymore. But the eat your vegetables and also your fruits, that's because of those antioxidants. And now in the field of nutrition, we are definitely finding those benefits of these phytochemicals, these embedded substances in our fruits and vegetables that are highly prized by our body. And the word antioxidant is the same theory like David mentioned with those lipids so they don't become rancid. It's the same theory in our body. We want those antioxidants to keep the cells functioning the way, the normal way, instead of breaking and being random, and then we have what are called free radicals in our body. And that is where we may be uh, having some incidence of health problems by um, not consuming those fruits and vegetables. And then lastly, I would like to say about, and I should mention with those nutraceuticals and functional foods, that is an area I'm doing research on right now with antioxidant characterization of our crops in Wyoming. Wheat, even choke cherries, some people are making choke cherry wine, so they asked me if I could characterize the antioxidants in choke cherries, uh, barley, all of those Wyoming products. I'm a farm kid. I've always been educated at land-grant universities. So I know the importance of taking what we have in the state and making it better, adding value, and adding value to our economy in the state. So that's where I'd like to end my uh, discussion this morning. We've covered a lot of things, and the questions were able to take me to a different way, so I appreciate that, too. Thank you, Peter. Great. Um, <laughs> and we certainly do have time to continue the conversation, questions and answer session with, with Rhoda. If there's questions or areas you'd like to take this conversation. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier on and what are they and what is the difference? Well, we hear so much about the probiotics and um, Dan and Yogurt and Activia are really promoting that. And Activia was developed in France. And what probiotics are, are the good bacteria grow in our gut, in our intestines. And it's in our intestines that we have all this, these nutrients absorbed from our food. So we want good bacteria or friendly bacteria, okay? And usually we say it's the dairy products that are fermented, yogurt, sour cream, buttermilk, but definitely yogurt, right? We now are finding prebiotics. Those are substances that have bacteria in that will then have our gut naturally form good bacteria. So the prebiotics can come before the pro, but they are in different foods. So some of the oriental foods, like the kimchi from Korea, is a prebiotic. The tempeh, that's another one. I may be, like I say, I maybe have not said the words right. T-E-M-P-E-H. I can butcher words. And the students usually say, you're not from around here. We can tell by the way you talk. <laughs> well, okay, North Dakota has an accent. I didn't know that. And then what was the other one I said? Um, sauerkraut, and I mentioned that last night to a couple of people at, at the library when we were discussing. So we're finding those are prebiotics. And inulin. And inulin is like starch. It can hold a lot of water, so it's good for fiber. So many of the fiber supplements now on the market have inulin in, but also it's there as a prebiotic. And the thing is with inulin, it's fructose unit. So, uh, okay, sugar. The chemical name is sucrose. Sucrose is made of glucose and fructose. So that's where the fructose makes up the inulin. High fiber prebiotic. So we're now finding, let's use those foods in our diet 
for developing that good bacteria in our gut. The probiotics, we already have the bacteria in the food that our, our gut has, so, and it just continues on. Rice that just came from oh, the dex oh, and my second question is brown rice is it brown when it's growing good one first question was distinguish between the dextrinized rice and that white rice the dextrinized rice has been heated in a dry form where we put it in a hot pan stir it around the exterior uh, becomes uh, shorter um, strands of starch so then we can add water and it um, becomes thicker faster but not as thick so it's a dry heat method and the next about brown rice rice is rice whether it's in Louisiana grown or over in the oriental uh, world it's rice but we have a sheath that protects the inside and then that's taken off and that's called the hull. And now we have a piece of rice that has a coating on that's brown. And that's bran. That's the bran portion. And now we take that brown rice, we just polish it up. We put it in, like think about your dryer and it has uh, sandpaper on the drum. And you put the brown rice in there and you just spin it around and you polish the brown rice and it becomes white. The reason brown rice is considered to be healthier is because of that bran layer on it. And with the bran layer comes some pitfalls. It takes longer to cook because the water can't get into that starch. The bran's protecting that starch inside. So it takes 40 minutes, 60 minutes in Laramie with our elevation, so, but normally 40 minutes or so at the sea level. Now, I don't know the answer to why they don't do it more naturally. <laughs> but I think consumer demand can get it turned around so it is less processed. But why they do it, that started for consumer friendliness. You know, and in the old days, it was considered to be economically superior. You were in a higher class if you used white wheat or white flour to make your breads versus the peasant bread, which was off-colored, which we would now buy as unbleached flour. So I think it was sort of that class thing. Um, I'm more into I want natural things, so I, I know what you're getting at. Um, but it does seem like the consumers have that opportunity to make demands and say they want more natural flour the way it was and that might mean you know not buying all-purpose white flour right or it might mean what writing the company writing uh, Pillsbury and all of that those types of companies but yeah that the point was they refine the, the wheat they strip it of its nutrients they bleach it with chlorine gas and then, and I tell my students, and benzoyl peroxide, which you know is for acne, uh, which I still suffer from, and all my shirts have white on, but uh, which is really proof it's effective for a bleaching agent. But then we add back nutrients that were originally in it, the B vitamins and iron. You know, it just doesn't make sense. When we add back those nutrients, though, the, the silver lining, let's say, is that there are a known amount of nutrients. It's consistent from every time, too. Natural products change. You know, they are agricultural products. No two are alike. So we may not get the same nutrient content in our wheat from harvest in 2011 as we do in 2013, you know. But, yeah, it is, the food industry is consumer-driven, even though 
some people don't really recognize that. Not that I'm pointing at you, John, but. <laughs> Pringles. I didn't know there were all those Pringles. I've never had a Pringles in my life. I've never had a Twinkie in my life either. It's too late. <laughs> oh, that's right. They took them away. You know, if you're interested, there's a really nice chapter in the last pollen book on apples. Do you remember the one on the transformation of apples and the industrial apple and analysis of the food value, breaking down what mm -hmm. kinds of vitamin mineral content are in an apple mm -hmm. you might find in a supermarket in the year 2010 versus one in Mm -hmm. One of the implications for this um, removal of the nutrients is, is the industrialization of flower production, right? That as, as we shifted from an industry that depended on older, slower, cooler forms of grinding and wheat um, and moved to, you know, steam power first, and, but uh, high pressure, high temperature milling of, of wheat, um, the machinery would get gummed up from right. the, the starch components in, in, in the so they had to, so they had to be removed in order for the to produce that nice white fluffy flour in uh, high volume, and, and and that you know the industrialization of our food supply explains a lot of of these kinds of transformations that require the reintroduction or the the, the supplementation of stuff that was already there, uh, simply because the industrial processes don't work so well with natural. It's a great segue to a two-part question I have. So from your experience as a registered dietitian, could you shed a little more light on the notion of food combining and how that may enhance nutritional absorption of foods? And then the second part of that is, in light of that and the industrialization of food, um, speak to the uh, increase in food allergies in our culture and why inflammatory responses in the digestive the first is about uh, nutrition, nutrition absorption of food combining. Because our body does need an array of different nutrients, um, combining foods with uh, diff the different nutrients does enhance the absorption of the nutrients. Just taking a capsule of vitamin C or vitamin D, even without food, it will not be as absorbed, as efficiently absorbed as when it is taken with food. And that's because our digestion begins in our mouth with enzymes in our mouth called amylase that starts breaking down starch. Then in our stomach, we start breaking down protein. We have pepsin in there. And then in our small intestines, we start breaking down vitamins, minerals, um, continue on with protein digestion and starch digestion. So when you have combined foods, so we have an array of nutrients at one time, all of this is synchronized and going on at the same time. And the body knows what to do with those nutrients it's absorbing, you know, and, and eventually get into our blood. But when you have just one nutrient, like the vitamin C or the vitamin D or the vitamin E, the body doesn't know how to do work with it. So many times it's just excreted. It's not even held in our body. It's just going through our intestines. After our intestines do all of this, um, um, removal of nutrients, now we have trash in our, going into our colon that then is ex excreted. And the second one, we believe combined foods at one time, not spacing them for, um, you know, avoidance of uh, fermentation and then not being able to assimilate the nutrients and all of that. So, but no, I am not. So the second question is about allergies. Oh, allergies. Yeah. Allergies, uh, there's a lot of information uh, for consumers to, to read and a lot of doctors have their different theories on allergies, but our environment is changing. And our processed foods are also contributing to allergies because before the age of the food labels in 1984, 
we really didn't know what was in the processed food. Now everything has to be listed. And we're still struggling with GMO uh, labeling as far as how we're going to label that. You know, is if we're using a peanut uh, gene in a tomato, how are we going to label that tomato that it's got peanut in? But it has been a lot of the environment, but also the food processing with combining and also transferring contents from one food to another, you know, with gluten-free products. You know, oats is gluten-free, but it's got to be processed in a wheat-free facility in order to be labeled as gluten-free oats. But we, all, we scientists know that oats does not have the gluten-forming ability as wheat does to make those gluten balls, so. I think we better um, call an end to this session. Again, over lunch, we'll have a chance to re-engage with Rhoda. We're going to take a 15-minute break. When we reconvene, we aren't going to reconvene in this hall. We're going to reconvene in the uh, meeting area, the lunch area, because David uh, is going to move us from kind of a cultural analytical approach to food, to a scientific approach to food, to as appropriate to a poet and musician, kind of artistic, performative approach to food when we, when we get back together um, in 15 minutes. So we'll thank Rhoda one more time and then we'll...